let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Welcome to Rabble Rants. I'm Santiago Helo Quintero, and alongside Jesse McLean, we're going to unpack the stories that have us most riled up and challenge the narratives around them. Yeah, no, watching everything in the U.S., it's such a comedy because it's so like, oh my God, this isn't real. Like the timeline of like a few weeks ago, Trump almost got assassinated. Trump was like, for sure win. Biden drops out. Kamala's in the race. Picks a VP that people like, and now suddenly, like, there's this whole, like, momentum around that, and it's just like... You didn't say momentum in a good way, though, you know what I mean? He was like, momentum. It, it's just, like, so, like, fictional. The way that things can be swayed without anything being around anything related to substance. Now, like... I'm a I'm a give some credit here, you know, like the what's the VP's name? Mike Waltz. Mike Waltz. Like I like some of the stuff he's done. Why? Because he like, you know, you talk breakfast and lunch programs for kids in schools. That's like my bread and butter, you know. As far as things that politicians can do that actually help people, that is one of the things that's very very important to me. Yeah. So he's the governor of Minnesota, and he signed into law that. Uh, school age kids in his state would get both breakfast and a free lunch. Like I, that that's an issue that I've been writing about for years. I've been talking about for years. Like that's extremely important. So like it gives even people like me something to be like, "Hey, you know, I can't be too mad here." I remember following like this was when I used to follow American politics, you know, back in the what ele- was that 2020 election? The the Democratic primaries when Kamala ran and face planted pretty hard. I think it was 2020. Yeah, the math is mathing there. Yeah. Like, I remember how bad and how unpopular Kamala was when when placed, you know, around other people. All of the horrible, horrible things that that she has done in her career in politics and and, you know, it's funny, like people on Twitter were like talking about how Trump donated both to Kamala's campaign and to Mike Waltz's campaigns at different points in time. And and it's how it's just all such a charade. It is. It's And like, not only is it a charade, I want to go back to your lack of substance. You have the discussion around like who's going to lead the party, even when it happens here. It's, it just really erases all the real issues. And it plays into that whole fucking game, that team sport game, that marketing campaign feel of politics in Canada. And, like, we are all guilty of doing it, you know. I see Mossgrub doing it. When we talked to Jeremy Appel, he was talking about, you know, if Trudeau needs to step down in order for the Liberals to have a resurgence, and Mossgrub is going on about drag meets, time to go... And all of these statements are very much true, but in the whole political strategy of things. And like, I know a political analyst, we got to talk about something. We got to talk about something. And that is something to talk about. But none of any of this is going to make a difference in anybody's lives. right? And none of this is going to give any boost to any significant issue that we've been fighting to get to the forefront. Right. And specifically, we're talking if you're talking about the genocide happening in Palestine right now and you have leftists that are just so excited about Kamala as though she isn't representing the current administration, thinking that it's some sort of hopeful moment again. I get choosing the lesser evil. I mean, we've talked about that so much. You know, that voting is essentially harm reduction at this point without real options. But There's a difference between saying a vote for Kamala will keep Trump out and he's the greater evil. If that's your argument, great. But then there's there's this this leadership cult, this this I don't know, this fandom that comes around it that has just has huge ick factor to me. People are changing their profile picture like leftists, not not even just liberals. I'm talking about like NDPers, folks that I 
know that are just with the party because there's no other better choice. You know, I mean, like people who know better, who know the current situation and the history of the Democrats, and they're, you know, making their profile picture, the, the Lady Liberty with Kamala or all these other memes that you're seeing go up and just pure standing for this woman as though she wasn't the VP during the last four years. Like as though she wasn't an attorney general who kept black men in prison past their dates more than anyone else just so she could get their free labor. Like she was a prosecutor who suggested they put parents in jail because their kids were absentee or delinquents or whatever she labeled them. You know what I mean? Like she isn't a solution and we get so caught up in the fear of this alternative that like I feel like some people just lose their minds like I lose perspective for sure like if you just forgotten what the goal was here ultimately like you don't need to be satisfied I, I, I'd be surprised to see how the third party does because there has to be a lot of voters in the U.S. that are just they're feeling like us like they're, <laughs> you can you know put lipstick on a pig and I'm not trying to be misogynistic i'm just talking about the act of trying to facelift a party by changing the leadership i i think lipstick on a pig is a pretty good metaphor when you consider kamala uh was a, a prosecutor right yeah yeah we like to call her a cop and then people correct you she wasn't a cop and it's like <laughs> oh, yeah i think it's a pretty we fair know. metaphor we understand the difference but yeah, no, it's just like I, I, I think back to the Toronto mayoral race in times like these, right? And like everything around Olivia Chow and what a disappointment Olivia Chow has been. It's like, look, like even someone like Olivia Chow and then look what happens. There's so many ways to to manufacture optimism in the public around candidates and and then when they get into power, it's always the same. It's always the same, right? And then I think back to the last episode we did with, you know, Voices for Unhoused Liberation and about, you know, the conversation around coercion and how coercion is, like, deeply built into capitalism. And that's what this feels like. It doesn't feel like democracy. It feels like we're, we're being threatened and then offered, like, this band-aid and being told to be happy about it constantly and, and you know we know what it is we know what the system is this isn't new to us but it's just the the it's the narratives around it that's frustrating right it's seeing people respond to everything that's frustrating um it's seeing leftists celebrate this that's frustrating Absolutely. And then you get the same old every time you put up a critique of the Democrats and their voting history and their policy history, you're called a Trump supporter. Like there's just no political nuance left, I suppose, when you only have two parties to choose from. I mean, they don't literally have two parties to choose from, but yes, they do. It feels like that, just like <laughs> <laughs> and we have limits here, you know, where you don't have that many options. And when you focus on these personalities, too, it again, it allows the issues to just go by the wayside. And that is ideal for both sides, for both sets of candidates to not actually have to have concrete plans. And although like I go back and forth with the people around me like, oh, did you hear this joke? And, and I'll give Kamala's running mate, uh, Governor Waltz there. Yes, he had the lunch program, but I just want to remind folks he was also the governor uh, during 2020. And when they called in the National Guard and heavy police response to the Black Lives Matter protests in Minneapolis, and, you know, and his stand on that was was not very friendly and nor has he been all that forthcoming with uh, Palestinian activists trying to meet with him. So he has some pluses, but you're not going to get movement on some of the big big pressing issues right now instead we're we're talking they're trading barbs they're allowed to stand up there and trade barbs about couches and other kind of inside jokes that on some front at least it's kind of revealing politics for the circus show that it is right like they're not even pretending to talk about anything that's important to your average american <laughs> anymore right they're they're making jokes back and forth about cat people's and couches and criminal records and that's another one that like we've just completely forgotten where we stand on this we're like well he's a convicted criminal like like that's the only reason that people should be afraid of a trump presidency 
is that he has a criminal record. And like you're talking about people who should be behind the abolition of police and a different kind of perspective on what criminal charges mean, right? Like be specific, you know, he steals from the poor. He's a racist motherfucker. He, someone is like, he's got ulterior motives that really just to benefit himself. So like we take on narratives that damage the whole, the whole game. You know, talking about the issues here, I, I saw this video where they were interviewing Trump supporters like they got to ask Trump questions. Right. And one of them was saying something about how, you know, he has uh, five kids and his kids are all really struggling with rent prices. Right. And like, what's Trump's plan? Just like Trump's response to that was like, yeah, we're going to drill more oil and like a bunch of other nonsense and regardless of what side of you know like which party people choose to support like the issues are are there they're real they're not getting talked about when they get brought up they get deflected to some other issue and then uh one other thing that like i'm noticing is a lot of people i saw some posts on twitter uh you know talking about like how mike waltz is that his name i'm gonna remember eventually i swear uh reminds people of like their parents before they got radicalized by conservatism or something like that and like people talking about how kamala feels like they're they're their aunt and like da 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 and like people making like a lot of references of how these politicians feel like their family they have nothing in common with any of you i think freud would would have a chuckle uh <laughs> some of the comments but these narratives around like these politicians as if they're people that we could relate to it all. I know. Drug meat's always going on about corporate landlords, corporate landlords. He includes that word corporate very specifically, although they are the worst of the worst. Like we've talked about that because he himself is a landlord. Right? His wife owns the property, but we did an episode on all of our politicians, are landlords, and it's the incredible number of these folks own properties and then get up there and start touting off how landlords are a problem. Yeah. It's such double speak. You know, I I hate shitting on people's parade because like everyone's kind of like you talked about momentum in that first kind of line. And it was, yes, you know, it just it did seem like Trump was a shoe in after he ate and spat out that bullet. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is definitely excitement brewing. Lord knows she's raising a lot of money and apparently hosting record breaking Zoom calls that. Uh, it, we're all supposed to get very, very excited about. And I would love to see a Trump defeat. But at the same time, I don't like when people get all wrapped up and excited about any kind of political leader because I know they'll have their hearts broken and then they'll go back into believing in a system or relying on a system that does not have their best interest at heart whatsoever. That personality cult that spins around elections is really how we get wound up in that. And no party deserves a facelift because it's all systemic. So also the people out there, you know, when I shit on all these parties and the lack of an option, they keep asking, or, you know, what about starting your own party, starting a new party? Sure, but it, it can't mirror the same system that you see these other parties in. Right? It would have to be something, again, wholly different. Because, in essence, these institutions create the people. They kind of, that's what boils to the top within these institutions, is these kinds of people. And when you structure it that way, like that is the winning, quote-unquote, winning strategy. Very Machiavellian. Like, you have to learn and play the game and win it, and then you can change the system. Like, I yeah. I hate Machiavelli. I don't buy into that. I believe you become those same games that you play. So, and I think our politicians are proof of that. Because we've seen really good people go into those systems, maybe people that you could have genuinely, legitimately been excited about, right? Yeah. Like Sarah Jama when she ran. But has she been effective in politics? Yeah, it's believing that the individuals involved are the issue and not the system. That's the problem, right? Noam Chomsky had, like, a famous example that, like, uh, talking about, you know, some of the problems with capitalism at the time when Jamie Dimon was the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. You know, he talks about how, like, okay, well, a CEO 
he has two options, right? Like he can either maximize the profits for shareholders or he'll be replaced by somebody who will maximize the profits for shareholders. So what does he do? Invest in things like Canadian tar sands and stuff, right? Because you're trying to make as much money as possible and how that that is how capitalism functions. You know, you either do the horrible thing that makes a lot of money or someone else will do it. And that's how businesses function, but that's also how electoral politics functions. And no wonder. One was created to uplift the other. You, you, you can think like that the truth matters and that actions matter. But <laughs> look at what's going on right now. Like all of these narratives. It doesn't mean anything. Right? No action done by either of these politicians actually matters. They can do a million horrible things and then one good thing. And what are we going to focus on? Well, if the media likes them, we'll talk about food programs right that's what's being fed to me i'm on the cynical algorithm i suppose <laughs> but that that you know like that's the type of thing that like someone like me who doesn't know this man well is gonna see that's my introduction and of course i'm a fan of food programs you know kamala has done a million things you know when kamala was not popular we heard about all the bad ones now we're not hearing about them so much are we Right? Because it doesn't matter what people do, what people say. It just matters what we choose to present. And you can make anybody a saint or a devil very easily. And that's how, you know, like, that's how it works. Like, I think the 2020 election really showed that to people, you know? We know, put all our faith in, like, this un this supposedly unimpeachable man, like Bernie Sanders, right? His entire life in politics... Seems to have never done anything wrong to anybody, right? Was that enough? No, that wasn't enough. When they wanted him gone, all it took was a couple phone calls and all the media coming alongside. So, no new party. I mean, for fuck's sake, people are trying it. Corn Cornell West was out here trying to make his own presidential run. Was that going to work? No, right? So, like... It's not that people haven't tried these things or that they've been bad at these things. You know, I think we have like this idea that, OK, like if we just, you know, get the recipe right, it'll work for us. No, it won't. Capitalism isn't an accident. You know, capitalism didn't just show up one day and like accidentally became the dominant system. Capitalism is extremely powerful when it comes to controlling narratives controlling the public and hiding the invisible hand of control it's obvious when you live under systems like feudalism fascism you know it the 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 systems of control are very obvious you know it doesn't it's systems that doesn't care about hiding its oppression capitalism's very good at hiding at gaslighting, at, at tricking people. So it's not just a matter of like, okay, we can just keep trying. And like, it really shows you how good it is because it convinces us that we can, that within its system, good people can come in and make a difference. It convinces us of that. We, somewhere inside, <laughs> we're all holding on to that feeling, that belief. And it also trains us to like ingest these fucking breadcrumbs as though they were feasts, right? Like I love food programs, total necessity, right? But what what was the bottom dollar on that policy? How easy was that for him to sign into law? Like that's bare minimum shit that we should make sure our kids are fed, right? Like, no, not every politician is doing it. But for me, yes, kudos. They get kudos. They don't get enough like highlights on it. I'll agree with that. But in the end, in this current circumstances, it's not like this one issue item. But for me, it almost is that resistance. It's how they're responding to resistance right now that is really concerning to me, uh, whether that be to like capitalism or their imperialist policies or like domestic protests. So whether they're it's Palestinian resistance or homegrown resistance. These politicians are all on the same page when it comes to that. Uh, they will suppress it at any given moment, you know, um, at every given moment. So, yeah, 
that's like the kind of one issue that I would suggest people to be pushing on these folks and, and examining when you really want to say, like, is there a difference between them? Because they'd all respond to, you know, our actions in essentially the same way. Yeah. One thing about, you know, believing in this myth, you know, I feel like one journey that we all go as leftists in like our early introductions is we, we start focusing on like certain policies, right? And when you learn about like different policies, you learn that like social democratic policies are incredibly logical for a functioning capitalistic society, right? Like having social safety nets, social programs, you know, all of these things, you know, access to essential goods and services and stuff like these things strengthen capitalism, right? So why doesn't it happen? I don't like the word strengthen. They prop it up longer. They allow it to sustain itself. No, yeah. No, but like it, it, it strengthens society under capitalism, right? Like it's something that capitalism can very easily function under a social democratic system. But so why doesn't it? Why is it not common? Why are these things constantly stripped away? If it's so logical, which it is, giving kids breakfast like let, 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 let's hone in on that for a second like giving kids free breakfast free lunch what does it do it re, it takes away burdens from families it means that kids have a chance to learn more because they need that nutrition to be able to absorb and retain the knowledge which means that they will then go and prosper more within society right like these are very logical things so why doesn't that happen more often because capitalism, and it's it's not about logic. It's not about what works best. It never has been. It is about the bottom line for those who are in power, about the richest, right? So, like, we need to let go of, like, these ideas that, like, yeah, I, I think what it really comes down to for me is, like, this idea of, like, truth and facts and logic being enough because it never will be enough under capitalism just because it works just because it's true doesn't mean anything that's why i took issue like kind of with your the word strengthening because they're really keynesian model band-aid solutions to to capitalism so they might make the lives a little bit easier for some during capitalism right? Because those mitigation efforts are necessary because of the damage capitalism does, right? And it, once you get such intense inequality, it will actually upend the system. So in order to sustain it longer, you know, to keep us from fighting back and rioting, you have to throw us bones every now and again, especially when it gets really ugly. And especially when we start realizing our power, that's, you know, it's been done many, many times to kind of prop up capitalism, prolong it. But I don't think it strengthens society. It just kind of placates us into thinking this could possibly work if we could just get the right people to make the right policies, but in those same institutions. And that's just not the case, right? So again, unless you're getting a, a presidential candidate to come up there and say they're ready to like upturn the system and change it all, I guess I won't be satisfied. No, yeah, no. And that's exactly the point, right? Is that we keep holding on to like, things within the system because at the end of the day capitalism is very good at making us afraid of change afraid of like letting go of capitalism and so like we, we look at these things and we we think okay that would be enough that would be enough for me if if society functioned you know this perfect social democratic system that would be enough and we could live with with that but you can't because capitalism will never exist like that long term because capitalism is about the rich and the powerful. They are the protagonists to the show or the antagonists, really, you know, <laughs> but that's who it's about. It's not about public good. It never will be no. about public no. good. And so that's why creating your own party, working within the system It'll never really be the solution. It will always get unraveled. If it was the solution, I promise you, it would have already happened. We've had enough people fired up about this. Enough people have had the knowledge and the information. 
enough that it would have worked by now. Thanks for letting us rant. If you liked it, share it. If you want to know more, check out the show notes. Whatever you do, keep on disrupting. <laughs>